chapter 5 of uh, Origins, Creation, and Morality. This is the uh, Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter of 2013, and the principal contributor is uh, James Gibson of the Geoscience Research Institute here in town. Uh, the editor is Clifford Goldstein, and there are a number of other people who have worked on the lesson. Um, we've already studied about the general subject, Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, the first three days of creation, the last three days of creation, and uh, uh, the use of creation in the rest of the Bible. And today we're going to be discussing creation and morality. And uh, then we still have uh, several other uh, lessons to go through. Our memory text is Genesis 2, 16 and 17. I'm wondering how many people learned it. And unfortunately, I haven't learned it in the NIV, but I did learn it in the, the old king. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, uh, you'll notice a few differences from the king. And... Um, at least some of them are actually uh, very good. Uh, you'll notice that it says here, when you eat of it, when you eat from it, instead of in the day you eat of it. Literally, it is beyond. It's in the day. But Biom has a rather wide semantic ma uh, meaning, and it doesn't always mean in the day, and fairly commonly, in fact, doesn't mean in the day. It means simply a, a generalized when. So people have sweated over that text, of course, a number of times. Um, and uh, it, isn't, it isn't meant to be specific to the day. And uh, the other thing you'll notice is that it says you will certainly die. <clears throat> Literally in Hebrew, it's dying, you will die. Uh, but the construct uh, is used for the meaning, you will certainly die. And so, although this isn't a literal translation, it is a more accurate translation of the thought uh, that's expressed in Genesis 2.17. People... Yes, just a minute. Thank you. I wonder if you could go back to that verse. Certainly. There is something I, I would like to really underline here. Uh, please notice that here is a, a conflict between knowledge and trust. Now, we imagine that knowledge is free and it ought to be shared by everybody with everybody. Yes? And God not sharing some knowledge with us means that he wants to keep us in the dark. Yes. That's the implied, um, how should I say, sentiment behind going against what God said here, instructed. However, what needs to be firmly appreciated is that information is not free. Information always, always comes at a price. It cannot just be automatically gained by us merely eating some fruit and now we're going to be wise. Every student who's ever tried to learn a book by putting it under his pillow has learned that it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and those of us who are into teaching, we, we have struggled with our students on this account many times. It takes sincere effort, labor, to gain understanding even when it is served. But before it can be served, it takes a lot more labor to make it available. And some knowledge 
quite simply is not readily accessible. Some knowledge may never be accessible to us. Think, for example, how would a neuron in our brain have the foggiest what an idea is? It's simply that notion of an idea is simply not on its scale to handle. And a neuron is built to handle information. But there is information on levels that we're simply not able to relate to. There is information that is in the mind of God. How do we access that? Well, God tries to make it accessible to us. You know what that's called? It's called communication. But communication can only work if there is trust. And ironically, that brings us right back to this first instruction. So, when God says something to us, could it be that he knows something we do not. And he's trying to tell us something. And we're not yet able to handle this. And naively, we bought into the scam that if we only ate something and it got into our stomach, we would suddenly become wise and know everything. Now, how many people think that doesn't smack like a scam like you've ever heard of one? You know, I, I read an interesting article, I, I, um, I think it was in Scientific American, where they were calculating the size of the linear accelerator that would be required in order to be able to detect one of the elusive subatomic particles. You know what they determined? that the size of the linear accelerator would need to be about two-thirds the size of our galaxy just to be able to detect this particle. Information costs. It comes at a great price. And contrary to the popular belief when the snake told Adam and Eve, you just eat of this and you will be like gods. Contrary to that belief, in order to gain that knowledge, it literally required the death of the Son of God. That was the price of that knowledge. Now, we picked the fruit. We wanted that knowledge. We had no idea what the cost was. And we certainly couldn't pay it. We didn't even know what it was, the knowledge, what the knowledge contained. But that brings us directly into this issue that we here struggle with a lot. And that is, how do we deal with knowledge which is in conflict, or purported knowledge, that's in conflict with trust? And trust is the underpinning of all morality that there can be. And violation of said trust is we, what we consider immoral. Take a little simpler look at this. I think there's a lot of knowledge that I would like to not have. And I think that God was trying, that, that the devil was trying to make it look like he was hiding something from us and God was trying to protect us from. There's a lot of things I would like for my children not to have personal knowledge of. I don't want them to have the personal knowledge of a divorce. I don't want them to have the personal knowledge of pain and suffering and drug addiction and things like that. And I think there's a lot of knowledge that, um, that God wanted to protect us from that devil still does a good job of painting that knowledge in an attractive fashion to make us think we want it when it would be nice not to have. I'm going to agree with that and uh, if we can pass the mic over. Uh, I'm going to furthermore say that uh, <clears throat> uh, that even in our age there's a lot of knowledge that um, I think most of us would prefer people didn't know like how to make, 
bombs out of your underpants. <laughs> it can be done. And I wish that nobody knew. Um, it would save us all, um, all kinds of grief at the airport. Um, right now, they tell me that, that the knowledge of how to build an atomic bomb can be gleaned from uh, the internet in various places. I wish it wasn't out there. This is not just any knowledge. It's a knowledge of good and evil. And the question is, do we really have to know that much about evil? Other than it is evil, and you'd best not be around it. And there are people who come back from a knowledge of evil and uh, use it effectively in evangelism. But it comes at terrible scars. And it comes at the loss of a lot of people who never made it back to talk to others about it. And uh, I, I don't think you can just simply say that knowledge is always good. And I think your point about trust is uh, an important one. I have a faint memory from Greek of a copulative chi between two items that equate them. Is there something in Hebrew that would equate good and evil, that is, join them together? Because if you put a period after good, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good. That so, sounds good. <laughs> now, I, I would prefer being a free spirit to know everything but make a judgment regarding it. I don't make a bomb. I might know how to, but I choose not to make it. I prefer to, to, to have access to knowledge because I see repressive governments around the world denying knowledge, denying information. You don't need to know. Even our own government says, well, if you knew, you would agree with us. I find that kind of control of knowledge to be dangerous. Well, th that gets back to how much do you trust your government? Oh, implicitly. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and that's, that's, in fact, the point. What it, what it boiled down to was, was Eve going to trust God or was she going to trust the snake? Now, the snake is pretty impressive. He's a talking snake, and they don't normally do that. And, um, you know, he was able to demonstrate to her that you could eat that fruit and it wouldn't kill you. Why, not only wasn't he dead, he was talking now. Just think what would happen if you ate it. Now this is kind of interesting because there's one omission here in the uh, in the list that uh, that uh, most of us here in America think about right away. Well, I was just going to say that we could probably spend the whole hour talking about the name of this tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Yes. When I think of the tree, it seems to come across as just evil. So I'm thinking, okay, where's the good in this story? And I suppose the good is God's whole response to the evil that happened. That seemed like a fair... We learned, we learned a lot about evil, but we've also learned about how God deals with evil. And it, come, it came at quite a, quite a price, as he was saying. Well, I think that that's part of it. It was actually sold as a, as a free gift, you know, you just take it and uh, nothing bad will happen, even though the name implies bad. There's one yeah. other thing I wanted to bring out. Um, it, it doesn't say in Genesis anywhere very much, but it does 
say in prophecy that the devil was cast out of heaven to earth. There's a problem there that needs to be dealt with, and I think we're overlooking that when we're with these answers. The okay. answers of, well, I wish I didn't know evil, or I didn't know what good was versus evil, or that kind of thing. Uh, it looks like things were on track that people had to know in order to deal with the problem of Satan. And this is a prophetic type of look. It isn't just with Genesis. I'm not sure that people had to know to deal with Satan. Well, he got thrown to the, the earth. What is, what's God going to do with him? Yeah, I don't have an, an exact answer for that, but I'm just saying that um, um, I'm just wondering if some of the answers that were given are a little oversimplistic. Well, evil had to be... Oh, sorry. You go ahead. The knowledge of good and evil on one tree, that's got to be what the devil's strategy is. He mixes what he knows of good and has known from whenever he was created with evil and he lures you with what looks and seems good and may originally have been but once he blends it with evil then it's going to kill you. In answer to uh, um, the earlier comment the, the question is also raised, why did God allow Satan to continue on after he was, uh, how should I say, expelled from heaven? Yes. Well, you see, evil wasn't clearly understood for what it was because it kept being presented as if it was something of value. And uh, somehow God is not fair by not giving you the full information so you properly understand everything about this. And Lucifer presented himself as somebody who was going to improve upon the whole of creation. And God is not having a part of it. That's because God doesn't see the wisdom of this. But something I like that, that, that is predicted about sin, I think it's in Revelation somewhere, where it said that in the end, the question will be asked, what is sin that it should have all these rights and privileges? And the answer to that question comes back, that sin ends up in the final analysis really being nothing but deception. But it has no content of its own, no real substance, nothing to really stand on, other than deceiving everybody about what is good. It raises an interesting question as to whether People who are caught in that truly understand what they're doing. That, um, that the knowledge of good and evil may be a false advertising. In fact, I, I wonder, as we're reading it, if the names of the trees had to be, um, what shall I say, agreed upon by both parties and that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was um, perhaps not completely falsely, but certainly misleadingly labeled. <clears throat> to begin again, people love to talk about human rights from the Magna Carta to the French Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen to various United Nations declarations. The ideas promoted that human, right, human beings possess certain quote, inalienable rights, end quote, rights that no one can rightfully take away from us. 
Yes, they're ours by virtue of being human, or at least that's how the theory goes. Uh, of course, uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, gets into that as well. But the interesting thing is that the French Declarations of the Rights of Man, um, in practice, didn't uh, fare well very, uh, for human rights themselves. Uh, they were there, but not uh, in, in theory, but not really in practice. The questions remain, what, what are those rights? How, can we, how are we to determine what they are? Can these rights change? And if so, how? Why should we as humans have these rights anyway? And some countries, for instance, women, were not given the right to vote until the 20th century. And some nations still deny it. So is that a right or not? Was it a right in 1800? Was it a right in 1700? Is it always a right and just simply denied? And why? How though can a government grant to people something that is their inalienable right to begin with? Is the government responsible to somebody else? Or is this a right that the state grants because it wants to? These are hard questions and their answers are inseparably linked to the question of human origins the study for this week's lesson. Our dependence on the Creator. Genesis 2.7 depicts a God as creating Adam individually and representing, represents him to be an intelligent moral being rather than an animal. The text does not say, but one can imagine a God using his hands to form the dust into the intended shape and size. Well, he used something to, to form man. One might think that the great sovereign of the universe would not stoop to get his hands dirty in the making of man, but the Bible reveals the creator is one closely involved with the creation. Scripture records many occasions when God willingly interconnected with the material creation, and the examples are given, Exodus 32, 15, and 16, where God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. I'd dearly love to see the handwriting on that. Um, Luke 4.40, uh, where God, uh, where Jesus was healing a number of people in John 9, 6, where Jesus put clay on somebody's hands. Indeed, the incarnation of Christ himself into humanity, into human flesh, where he day by day interacted with the created world in much the way we do, refutes the notion that God would not stoop to get his hands dirty among humanity. And then it says, read Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and what command did God give to Adam and what is implied in this command? And that, of course, is the memory verse that we uh, read before. Um, and that's the old king, and you'll notice that it, it is in the day, although, again, the other translation is better. And uh, it does say, thou shalt surely die, which is, again, idiomatic translation, but appropriate one. And the implic implication is, of course, that God has the right to do that kind of commanding. And uh, we may ask, what right did God have to make rules for Adam and Eve? But they, com they compare the situation to that of a child in a family. The child's parents provide the child with a home and all of life's necessity. They love the child, have the child's best interests in mind. Their greater experience and wisdom can spare the child much misery if that child will accept their guidance. Some children find this guidance difficult, but it is universally recognized that as long as the child is dependent on the parent for necessities, the child is obligated to uh, accept the parent's rules. I think also the parent needs to love the child in like manner because we are always dependent on our Heavenly Father for life and its necessities. It is always appropriate for us to accept God's guidance. I think the key there is do we serve a loving God or not, and if the answer is we do, then we need to accept because God does know more than we do, considerably more. Because he is a God of love, we can trust him to always provide what we need for our own good and to give us good advice. That's, of course, my own addition. Read Psalm 95, 6 and 7 and Psalm 100 and the psalmist expresses our dependence on God. and. Uh, You'll notice that Psalm 95, 6, and 7 will come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, 
for he is God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And then it goes on to say, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Famous passage quoted in Hebrews. Uh, but we kneel before the Lord, our maker. Two things. One, he made us, he knows, he, he's the, uh, uh, the same way we read owner's manuals uh, carefully. And uh, it was even more reason because the owners were only people like us or the, the, the uh, creators of the tools that we use are people like us. The creator of us is somebody infinitely smarter and more loving as well. And then, of course, Psalm 100, uh, Know ye that the Lord, he is God, is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So there's, there's two prongs to it. Um, Number one, God loves us and wouldn't withhold anything from us that wouldn't be good for us, or, or that would be good for us. And number two, that he knows us way more intimately than we know ourselves. And that combination of knowledge and love deserves to be respected. In the image of God, read Genesis 1:26 through 28. And what special attribute was given to humans that was not given to the animals? And of course, that is that God let it, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and, of, and so forth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. By the way, if you're looking for poetry in Genesis 1, right there is where it is. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, which means that male and female is part of the image of God. And uh, we were intended to be together. And uh, th this is very fascinating because the rest of the Bible is very, very, uh, the Old Testament in particular, is very, very careful to have God be one. Ahad. But let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that's very clearly uh, plural in the Hebrew. Um, and and it's, you, you might skip over it and say, well, if God's going to talk to himself, then it's kind of hard to make it. God said, let me make man in my image after my likeness. But then he goes on to create in his own image and then creates male and female. Implying that something within God interacts with, I don't know, itself, something separate. Um, almost implying, if not a trinity, certainly a, a, um, a, uh, uh, a God that's not totally unitary, simple. And um, in fact, if you're going to be really technical, there is a dual in Hebrew. So if there were two and only two, um, you would have said it uh, in a way that, uh, that leaves you uh, uh, with a dual. But there's actually... So this is a plural, which means three or more in Hebrew, which is kind of interesting. Question? Uh, yes. Could we think of the Trinity in that verse as like H2O, which has three forms, but it's all H2O? It's one, but it's three. I, I am not sure that we have enough of the conceptual apparatus to be able to, to say what it is. Uh, perhaps we can say it's like in certain ways, but I think that that's as close as we would get to that. Um, and... Uh, 
So I would, I would be very cautious about, uh, uh, well, let me, let me give you an illustration. Okay. According to quantum mechanics, light behaves like a wave sometimes and like a particle sometimes. And by watching it, we can determine whether it behaves like a wave or like a particle. If it's a wave, it can go through two slits at the same time. If it's a particle, it strikes in a particular spot. We can write down mathematically what should happen, and our predictions agree with reality to about 11 places on the decimal system at least. But nobody has a clue as to how that actually works. I, one of the Quantum physicist says, if you think you understand quantum physics, that's a good sign that says you don't. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty well true. And mm -hmm. if, uh, I think C.S. Lewis put it that way. Um, uh, God has to be at least as difficult as modern physics and for the same reason. So I'm not sure that we are able to 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 say too much about the Trinity other than, other than that there is some kind of plurality in God that allows Jesus to come out of it. Well, in spite of what you just <laughs> said, <laughs> I will venture to say <laughs> um, there's one humanity, but there's billions of human persons. There's one divinity, but there's three divine persons. There, there is one, and yet, like I say, inside the one, obviously, there is more than one. In fact, there's more than two. What exactly is the image of God? This question has generated a great deal of discussion, and opinions vary. But the verses provide some clues regarding the nature of the idea. First, note that the, to be made in the image of God implies that we resemble God in certain ways. One important aspect of the image of God is that God gave humans dominion over the other creatures, which God has of, over his creation, of course. Um, but that's what we were given. That's not necessarily what uh, is inside of us. Uh, notice, too, that God purposed to make man in our image, that is, an image involving the plurality of the Godhead. Then he made humans male and female. The image of God is not fully expressed in an individual, but in relationship. And I think that's important. As the Godhead is manifested in three persons in relationship, the image of God in humans is expressed in relationship of male and female. And then I think beyond that, to relationship between various humans. The fact that we're all here is a little tiny bit like the image of God. Relationships, of course, imply responsibility and accountability, which means morality. Hence, right here, we are given a strong hint as to how morality finds its basis in the creation story, which means that the God who creates other creatures to be his companions, if you please, um, expects us to treat other people like our companions. And of course, this is the key to understanding who is my neighbor, as in the story of the Good Samaritan. Read Genesis 9, 6 and James 3, 9. In what ways is the idea of humans being made in the image of God clearly really linked to the concept of morality? And in these texts, well, Genesis 9, 6 is whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. In other words, murder is going to be punished. As murder gets capital punishment. And why? Is because for the image of God made he man. And if you're wondering why it seems that Christians are mostly lined up against such things as abortion, cloning, and so forth, 
and why the secular world by and large doesn't see a problem with it. That's why. It has to do with the image of God. Uh, yes, do we have a mic here? Ah. I've always uh, know, um, felt that as Christians we have, uh, and people who believe in creation, um, we have a basis for this. But um, I, I always wondered how do evolutionists, uh, how are they able to explain morality, what we are talking about? And this week I was listening to a radio program, I only caught a bit of it, and uh, uh, this uh, person who was talking about, I think, a book that she wrote, um, was saying that, look, man is um, inherently good. This was her basis, which is totally opposed to what we believe the Bible telling us. And I'm just wondering what people would comment or say to a person like that, um, who, that something that w they could relate to and understand. What I'm asking is, um, if this person is saying, well, because she doesn't believe God, she doesn't believe that uh, creation, I think it, the talk was about um, why are we imposing uh, uh, beliefs of Christianity in our schools. I think that was the basis of it. But um, she was saying that, look, man is inherently good. That was her underlying thought. And what can we who do not believe that, say to a person like that. May I ask a simple question? If you start with that, then how can you turn around and judge Christianity as being less than good? Well, because Christianity says that, that people are less than good, and that's obviously wrong. Uh, yeah, but, but the idea of being inherently good means that you have to be accepting of others around you. Uh, and the simple fact that you're rejecting somebody obviously means that you're not consistent <coughs> in this regard. Um, so what you're ultimately saying is, I'm good, but you're not. And as a matter of fact, that's what it what it finally degenerates into. And this is, this is a huge problem. Uh, theoretically, of course, people who do that just simply look past it and ignore um, that problem. Well, I understand that quite a few evangelical Christians or and other Christians of other denominations and even Adventists believe in evolution or theistic evolution. If, if you believe in that, where does the origin of evil come in? And why is there a need for Christ to die and save people? And how would you, where does hell come in? I mean, for those types of uh, evangelical Christians, how do they put that all together? How do they reconcile that with a long age? an evolutionary process? Well, I think what happens is that people grow up believing in a number of different things and then sometimes the ground gets cut away from part of their belief system and the rest of it is left kind of hanging in midair it's sort of like those cartoons where the, the wily coyote runs off the cliff and uh, keeps on running and then looks down and, oh my, and then falls, you know. And, and many people are caught in that kind of running off of the cliff. The foundations are cut out from underneath them and they don't realize it. Uh, and it may take 20 or 30 years before they realize that that foundation is gone and then the next foundation is gone and then the next foundation is gone. And you see people like Howard Van Til, for example, who started out very, very strong Calvinist, but accepted long ages for life. And then accepted God's non-interference in the development of life. And 
spent years arguing for decades, I think, actually, arguing for his worldview, and then finally just kind of caved. Now, that doesn't just happen in other denominations. You can look to see who a, an arch-conservative like Robert Brinsmead started out that way. Very conservative, very biblical. You can argue about whether he had the biblical principles right or not, but certainly uh, a believer in, in the Bible. And then at a certain point became convinced that um, creation didn't really happen and uh, his faith just kind of disappeared. It happens. But a lot of time we're looking at people halfway in between when they're still maintaining their belief system except for that the foundations have kind of been cut out. Yes, and then uh, can we pass the other mic up to... Uh, so, the, so they haven't really taken their concepts to the full extent to realize where it's leading them then. They don't realize that they don't have a foundation anymore. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and what you can see, you can watch old landmarks kind of start to crumble. It's, it's a little bit like watching a flood eating into a bank and then the, the, the bank is undercut and then finally whatever was on top of the bank, perhaps a house, crumbles into the water. But if you didn't cut the foundation out from under it in the first place, that collapse wouldn't have happened. I, I think that's where I have a hard time with some of our professors and our, un our own universities and that I think it is intellectually um, disingenuous to have cut that foundation right out from underneath it because they were intimidated enough by a degree of knowledge at a certain period of time that that intimidated us into saying instead of taking the trust that was discussed earlier and accepting the fact that science continually changes we undercut the foundation for Christianity and when you have a professor of theology sit right here in our class and tell me that we well, but millions of, Amer of Christians believe in evolution without actually having done the intellectual follow through of that thought pattern to go right where you just said and say you just cut the foundation out of Christology, you have no fall, therefore no need for a redeemer, and you haven't done that intellectual thought through as a person in a position that should be doing that thought process. If you have someone who doesn't, isn't trained that much, I could give them an excuse for that. If you have someone who has spent their life at this, I cannot give them an excuse for failing to see the consequences of their choices. Now, they're free to believe that, but they should at least acknowledge the consequences of that choice of cutting the foundation right out from underneath Christianity and admit, then I guess I can't be a Christian if I'm going to cut the foundation out from underneath why Christ exists and why he had to sacrifice, what the atonement is all about, because there has to be a fall for that. Um, uh, over here. Yes. I'm, I'm, this, <laughs> this, this has prompted me. <laughs> when I first came to Loma Linda, um, and I have to confess, I have um, met, I have found some wonderful friends, deeply spiritually, deeply committed people here that that I only wish I would have known beforehand. But I have also met a lot of people who are greatly troubled. I, in many ways, feel like a sheep herder who has come to the front lines to see how the battle goes. And all I see is the Philistines are laughing and the faithful are dithering, wondering, wringing their hands and wondering, my goodness, this Goliath is so huge, so humongous. 
Well, none of us could do anything about that. Maybe we have to learn to live with it. Maybe, well, we're going to remain faithful for, for, for sure. But Goliath sure looks real. The Goliath of evolution sure looks real. What could any one of us do about it? Know what I'm saying? Yeah. In, 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 in situations like this, it seems to me the only way we can actually retain our sanity, it's no longer even a question of mere, uh, how should I say, uh, integrity. We're talking about retaining sanity here. Is we need to know where we have placed our trust. Is it in our intellect and our ability to fight this giant? <clears throat> you recall David didn't say, oh, but oh, I'm strong enough. He said, but there is a God who sees this. How is it that we don't think of that? We have not taken him into consideration. That is where we come short a lot. We have begun to think of ourselves as Adventists and an Adventist people as us against the giant. We do not see us being here, not because of our merit, but because God wanted us to be here. God was the one who called us into existence. He called this movement before we were born. Mm. And he had a reason for it. And whether we succeed or fail is not our problem. It's God's problem. So we shouldn't imagine that just because oh, I don't know how to solve this giant problem, that it, the problem is insoluble. That is a conclusion that is not warranted. We need to remain trustful in the one who called us into the existence in the first place. We love to sing praises about how the Lord has established Loma Linda here. But when it comes to how we're dealing with our current problems, we think, oh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we, you know, it's all about us as if God has been forgotten. Yes. I have a, a comment and a question. And the comment is a comment, not necessarily a solution, but I would like to suggest that one of the reasons we have difficulty with Dr. Wise person and Dr. Wise scientist and Dr. Wise theologian is because we have sent them to various institutions to become wise people without the tools to know how to evaluate. I think that we need to be ta teaching critical thinking at the elementary level and not waiting to teach it until graduate school because I can attest to the fact that the, the wise people that I studied under were incredibly persuasive, incredibly nice, very concerned about making sure that we learned what we needed to know, and not a single one of them, well, one maybe was a Christian, but, but they were so persuasive. And then we read authors that are so wise, and we don't teach kids the tools to evaluate those people. Hence, when they go out in their 20s and, and 30s to graduate school, they're not equipped to evaluate what they're hearing and maintain their faith. And so consequently, when they come back to teach in Adventist schools, they haven't yet learned how to do their own evaluation well. That's my comment. Now, my question, maybe a suggestion is, in <clears throat> the verse that says, in the day that you eat of this, you will die, I would like to suggest that they did die that day Eve died spiritually and instantly became a temptress to Adam. 
and he saw what was going on and he loved her so much he was willing to follow her into sin because he would had no clue where he was going and the first thing they did was begin to squabble they had died spiritually Well, there, there was something within them that died. They didn't actually physically die physically that day. Physically they didn't, but spiritually but the point, they did. But the point, is, the point is that the text does not have to read in the day. In fact, if you're being precise with the Hebrew, it doesn't read in the day. But if you're talking about f physically, that's correct. But if you're talking spiritually, they died. That is true. Yeah, I think as we, as we look at this uh, picture, I uh, need to keep in mind that uh, numbers are not a test of truth. And Christ was very direct in that when he said, narrow is the gate and few are they that find it. So we need to keep that in mind. Our important thing is how we relate to God, to the Bible, and so on. Not so much how the numbers are going. And uh, that's, I think, one thing that, uh, that uh, we as Adventists should constantly keep in mind and those of us who wind up going to uh, higher education elsewhere need to keep in mind even more, and that is the majority does not determine truth. I think, you know, in answer to the question, you know, why didn't they die the instant that they ate? My understanding is in Revelation it says the lamb slain from the foundation from the, of the world and Mrs. White says, as soon as there is a sinner, as instantly, as soon as there is a sinner, there is a Savior. So had there not been a Savior, they may have gone blink, and that would have been the end of it. But we had a Savior, and he says, I will take the penalty. So man died, except that Christ took that death upon himself. That's how I understand it. No, my point is partly that there are all kinds of ways we can explain why they should have died that day. Spiritually, they died that way, day, but physically, they did not. Now, that would be a problem if you have an inerrant scripture that is understood to mean that God uh, had to make sure that, or somehow, it had, it, had to make, it had to make sure that they died that day. Because it doesn't say spiritually died. It says died. You shall die. But the key is, it doesn't say in the day. It's, it's an idiomatic expression. It means when. And the when is left indefinite. In fact, if you want to see earlier on in the, in the, in the same, the same uh, chapter, you have in the day when God, the Lord created the heavens and the earth. It does, that is, it's when the Lord created the heavens and the earth. And the failure to recognize that that, that, that uh, expression beyond meant when and not in the day has caused people all kinds of uh, grief that they didn't have to have. Uh, yes, yes, and... Um, I would just like to comment that while your arguments are correct, uh, at least in my view, um, I think that the very fact that we have to emphasize these things suggests to me that we have a problem. And that is the problem with communication. All communication um, is there for a purpose. <laughs> We need to be willing to receive the communication that was sent. If we're looking for a way to misunderstand something, we will always find it. Think of Bill Clinton answering when he was asked some questions. Well, what do you mean by the word is? This is a two-letter word. And he wanted all these definitions for it now. <laughs> and he was a lawyer. So he could think of many different ways to interpret is. Uh, when he full well knew what the questioner was thinking of, as intending to do, and all this, whenever we start using communication for the purpose of breaking off 
the, commu uh, the, the information conveyance rather than to actually accomplish it or distract from it, then, then we're actually violating the very purpose of communication. And, and sadly, uh, when we engage in argumentation that really has no good reason other than the fact that we want to get a certain viewpoint through, in spite of the fact that it's precisely contrary to what was intended, uh, then we are basically doing this kind of, I don't know, exercise that's pointless, heating the countryside. Yeah, now, and, and that's, that is a really important point. If you're trying to misunderstand, um, it's very hard to get you to understand <laughs> because the whole purpose of what you're doing is to misunderstand. And, uh, and I think that many of the objections to the biblical record are, in, in fact, exactly that. Yeah, on the other side of what I just said, that the instant man ate, you know, there's a savior. Mrs. White has another really curious statement that I ran across, and I wish I could find it exactly. But she said that after the fall, man was, his, his physical strength and mental strength and so forth was deteriorating until eventually he would become extinct. And I thought that was a really interesting comment um, because I heard a famous geneticist say essentially the same thing, that each generation had some gene um, deterioration so that man would become extinct. So, you know, that's, that's the other side of kind of the same coin, that once he sinned, we would become extinct, whether that day or whether, you know, from deterioration over time, it's hard to put the two statements together exactly, but I thought that was an interesting comment that she made in light of the current geneticist um, research that our genes and stuff are deteriorating each generation and eventually we will become extinct because we'll just won't have the strength anymore. Yeah. I believe the uh, great controversy also involves angels and created beings on other worlds. Mm-hmm. Getting back to where, where the uh, lesson was going, uh, you'll notice that in James it talks about, therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Of course, that's uh, the uh, King James translation of uh, what boils down to the image of God and is citing Genesis 1. Just one of the passages that we didn't talk about last week that... Uh, alludes to the creation. And the point of it is that, that in Christian thought, morality is grounded in this creation. Number one, somebody who knows how to make us. And number two, somebody who loves and cares for us and wants us to do well. And we do well to listen. Humans have wrestled for millennia with the question of morality, even before one gets into what is the right kind of morality, the whole idea of morality itself raises a host of deep issues. Why should humans, as opposed to beetles, fleas, or even chimps, have a moral conscience, a concept that distinguishes between right and wrong? How can beings essentially made of amoral matter, quarks, gluons, electrons, and so forth, be aware of moral concepts? The answer can be found in the early chapters of the Bible, which reveal humans to be moral creatures made in the image of God. There's something beyond quarks and gluons, I think, actually. Um, there's also arrangement for one thing, and there may be more than that. Um, made of one blood, this is part of our morality. In Genesis 2.23, Adam is given the task of naming his wife, whom he called Hava. Uh, Eve is the English that comes through the Latin, that comes through the Greek, that comes from the original Hebrew. This is related to the Hebrew word haya, which means to live. Uh, and in fact, uh, and uh, in Genesis 1-2, and the earth was, without form and void, that verb is haya. Um, it's actually haita, it's the female. Uh, <coughs> and um, Jews sometimes refer, uh, See, the Hebrew word for Eve, Hava, can be translated as life-giver. 
So this is the, what they call the Hiffel form, which is to cause to have something happen as opposed to having it just happen. If you cause somebody to walk, you use the Hiffel form of Holake instead of the standard form of Holake. Uh, actually, it's Halak. Halak is uh, walking. Um, but uh, the, the yod in the, in the middle of it turns into a wow or a vav, as they would say now. So that's why it's hava instead of haya. Interestingly enough, Yahweh, uh, which has the W in the middle, Y-H-W-H, you may have seen that spelled, is actually he will cause to be in Hebrew. I got that from, with great tooth pulling, I got that out of my uh, a professor of Hebrew at the uh, University of Chicago who didn't want to admit that, but that's what it is. <laughs> it was um, <clears throat> interesting. It's almost like he was admitting to being a creationist or something. Um, <clears throat> Eve's name represents the fact that she is the ancestor of all humans. We are all one family in the most literal <coughs> sense, which of course has implications for, uh, you know, races, and uh, our interaction between the various races. To be technical, we are all members of one race, the human race, and the rest of it is irrelevant. Um, read Acts 17.26. How does Paul link the brotherhood of all humanity to the creation? And we'll compare it with Matthew 23.9. And of course, this is Acts 17.26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men. Period. We're all related. Yes. My mind stopped on the word morality. You, you suggested that we all have morality as human beings, different from insects, etc. And yet scripture says we've all sinned and fallen short. So morality is more of a concept here than a construct. And I recall a text in the spirit of prophecy that people got enraged over when I read it. Ellen White says, all who are not determinedly on the side of Christ are under the control of Satan. No neutral ground. Which affected me because as an early pre-Christian I wanted neutrality. I didn't want to be on the side of God. I didn't want to be against God. I wanted to be left alone. But there is no left alone in the, in the cosmic warfare. You're either on one side or the other. But if not determinedly on the side of Christ, you are under the control of Satan. You know, uh, Jesus put it that way several times, and it's interesting he put it both ways. He who is not against me is for me, and he who is not for me is against me. So sometimes we don't fully understand exactly how that works, but I agree with you. If you want to be your own boss and don't have to be responsible to anybody else, you're on the wrong side. Right there. Because the fact of the matter is we are all responsible. We are all expected to act like good Samaritans. And if we miss that, we're in trouble. And Paul starts out with this argument that God created us all, and he created and he, uh, he left us in various places, but that we're all descended from one person, and that therefore we have responsibility to each other as relatives. And of course, in Matthew 23, 9, he says, Call no man your father upon earth, because one is your father which is in heaven. Now that could be taken as metaphorical, of course, as well. So I'm, I'm, I find that a little bit weak as a support, because our father is partly our adopted father, not just our literal father. But he is, in fact, also our literal <coughs> father, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God that applies to every single one of our genealogies. We are united in that we all descended from one woman and from one man. 
God is the father of us all. This fact is the basis of human equality. So racism has no place in a truly Christian community. Uh, if we ever needed proof of how far fallen we are, how badly sin has damaged us, we have it in the sad fact that humans often treat one another worse than some people treat animals. Uh, just a minute, let's get this for the record here. Yes. Something that is often overlooked is that this, uh, the, the, the full title of Darwin's book was on the preservation of species. Uh, no, no, no. On the origin of species and the preservation of, of favored, favored races. races. Yes. Most people nowadays drop this second part of the title because it casts an unfavorable light on Darwinism. Well, this is one of the interesting things that's happened to uh, 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 modern society is that there is this uh, anti-racist uh, prejudice, which I approve of. Prejudice simply right. means prejudging. Uh, but it's not grounded in anything. It's not because we're related to each other. Well, maybe it is. But there isn't, there isn't a single ancestor to which we can all trace our ancestry. Um, there isn't a God who made of one blood all nations. Um, and yet that's one of the interesting things that that's sacrosanct. And I think sometimes we miss that. Um, Proverbs 14, 31, and 22, 2, and these ones link again. The, he that oppresseth the poor reproaches his maker, but he that honoreth him have mercy, hath mercy on the poor. Uh, shades of uh, Matthew 25. Uh, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. God made us all. We all have responsibilities. I'm not sure I can say we're all equal. I'm not as tall as some people in this class. I'm taller than some others. Um, I'm not as strong as some people. I'm stronger than others. But that's not the most important part of us. And there's a certain respect for people regardless of what their outsides look like that I think that uh, Christianity that has its roots in, a, in origin by divine creation has respect for that really can't be purchased in other ways very easily. Years ago, after Darwinism became fashionable, some, and there were prominent people too, by the way, people like... Um, Andrew Carnegie, uh, people like uh, John D. Rockefeller, justified the exploitation of the poor by the rich on the grounds of social Darwinism. The idea that in the natural world, the strong overcome and exploit the weak. So why should not the same principle apply in economics? And uh, the question is asked is, how is this another example of why a correct grasp of origins is crucial to the understanding of morality? Well, given the text we had before, uh, we're not supposed to be uh, exploiting other people. And of course, Jesus made that very, very clear, as we'll get to. God created us in his image, which means, among other things, that he intended for us to resemble him in character. And uh, in order for us to be like God, in the sense that we reflect his character, we need to know what it is. Reading Matthew 5, 44 to 48, and of course, this is a passage that says, love your enemies. Now that's undarwinian. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Because 
you can be children of your Father who makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That is, he treats his enemies pretty well. For if you love them that love you, how are you different from anybody else? Thought the tax collectors do the same thing. And, but if you want to be perfect, you love your enemies. And that's interesting. It doesn't say you make sure that you keep all the health laws. It doesn't say that you make sure that you keep the Sabbath even. The central point is love regardless because that's what God does. And we are children of our Father. That's the creation support for morality. I don't know how you purchase that in, uh, in a non, in a, in a secular society. Uh, Luke uh, 10, 29 through 37, and that, of course, is the story of the Good Samaritan. A uh, man went down among thieves, a certain Samaritan took care of him, and then Jesus finishes up and says, As which, of now, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And he said to him, the one that showed mercy on him, he couldn't say the word Samaritan. He said, Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. And that's the commission that we have. And then, of course, Philippians 2, 1 through 8 is the passage where it talks about Jesus. It says, we, you know, we need to be humble with each other and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who laid aside his glory and being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient even to death of the cross. And something that might make it connect a little better, the cross was supposed to be terrifying. Um, if you want to put it in modern terms, it was state-sponsored terrorism. That's how Jesus died. We don't usually think of it in quite those terms, but that's what it was. The Romans wanted to make sure that nobody ever did what that person did because you see what happens to him. He died a slow, agonizing death in front of everybody. And the purpose was terror. It was to make sure that you didn't try that because you knew what would happen. The story Jesus told involved two men from different people groups, the Good Samaritan, groups that were normally antagonistic towards each other. But Jesus showed that they were, in fact, neighbors. Each was within the other's sphere of responsibility, and God was pleased when their differences were set aside and one treated the other with compassion and kindness. The exact opposite of what you'd expect in a Darwinian world. What a contrast is set between the principles of God's kingdom and the principles of Satan's rulership. God's calls the strong to care for the weak, while Satan's principles call for elimination of the weak by the strong. God created a world of peaceful relationship, but Satan has distorted it so thoroughly that many regard survival of the fittest as the normal standard of conduct. If the vicious process of natural selection in which the strong overpower the weak were the means by which we came into existence, why should we do differently? If we accept this view, are we not following God in the dictates of nature as he ordained it when we advance our own interests at the expense of the left naturally selected, if we accept this view? What are other ways in which you can see how an understanding of our origins can accept our moral concepts? And it leaves that open for you. Morality and accountability. In an earlier lesson, we looked at Paul's sermon on the, to the men of Athens and noticed that how he finishes up. In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because 
He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. That is, it moves straight from God's created us this way to, and God's going to hold us accountable. Which, of course, is one of the uh, downsides of Christianity if you're behaving in a way that uh, uh, gets negative judgment. You don't want uh, there to be a God. Did, are you just holding the mic? Okay. Um, Paul's sermons to the men of Athens began with creation and ended with judgment. Which, of course, is the ultimate, you know, morality. And yes, you'll be held accountable for what you did. According to Paul, the God who made the world and everything in it has fixed a day in which he will judge the world. To be endowed with morality implies accountability, and each of us would be held responsible for our actions and our words. And Ecclesiastes 12:14 says that God's going to bring everything into judgment. And Matthew 12, 36 and 37 uh, contains a very interesting fact, and that is, this is one of the two places where Jesus uses the word dikaiao, the word that's variously uh, translated justified and made righteous. Um, we uh, look at Paul's use of the word very carefully. We, we miss Jesus' use of it. That every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by their words thou shalt be justified, and by their words thou shalt be condemned. And, you know, it's interesting because it's not fair for God to judge us on our off time words, is it? Well, actually, it's the most fair. Because if we realize somebody is watching, then we're moral because they're watching. If we do stuff when no, nobody's looking or we think nobody's looking, that reveals the actual inside character, the way we really think. And that's why God can judge us appropriately, because that, uh, that actually comes from the inside. You know, it's like um, you can take a tree and you can tie oranges onto it if you want to. But it's the oranges that come just from the tree itself when nobody's tying them on. Those are the ones that tell you that it's really an orange tree. Oh, I was going to say, it's sad that uh, it isn't just the evolu evolutionists who've aren't moral. Uh, the ones who destroyed Christ were his own people. Uh, and when you look back to the Crusades and the Inquisition and things like that, I mean, it almost seems like more has been done through supposedly God's people than, than those that aren't. <laughs> No, that is true, and one of the things we have to be careful of is to say that it all boils down to creation only, uh, because there have been creationists in past history that have done some pretty terrible things. The Inquisition was probably all supported by people who were, in fact, uh, Christian and believers in a God who created the world. Uh, Yes, can we pass the mic over? I was just going to address that issue of that uh, that's commonly thrown in our face is that all these atrocities are done by people that are Christians and more people have died from Christianity. That's actually technically not true. If you look at over five centuries, the numbers get up to about 200,000 deaths related to Christian quotes Christian governments which you could argue obviously they missed the point of Christianity with their actions but that claim to be Christianity in the last 50 in the 50 years of this last century we had in the realm of 50 million to 100 million people killed by governments that did not believe in a God so to throw up in the Christians faith are failures which are significant and we have to own but then to imply by that failure that failure to have God is better has not been born to be true in the la last century. No, and I agree. I, I think that the, the, the point is that you can use it to argue that Christian governments have often missed the point. Um, 
and perhaps there's something about government that makes it hard to be truly Christian. But, but the solution is not to get rid of God because that solution makes it worse. Uh, seems to me we, uh, in the equation here, we need to put God's uh, persistent interest in saving everybody and um, it's true we are accused at times uh, unfairly of all kinds of things and uh, I agree with the previous speaker about uh, the figures show something opposite but uh, uh, we need to have this redemptive attitude of God towards everybody uh, Read Revelation 20, 11 through 13, and this is the uh, this is a judgment scene in Revelation, where the books are opened and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, and then Matthew 25, 31 to 40, which uh, starts out when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory and before Him He shall gather all nations. And he shall separate them one for another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And of course, this is the one, the passage where it talks about, um, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And the converse of that, of course. Everyone who lived will meet together in God's presence to face the judgment. The difference between the two groups in Jesus' parable is how each person treated those who were in need. The very people that are supposed to be destroyed if you're a, uh, a, a to make room for you if you're a uh, thoroughgoing Darwinist. The Creator is interested in how His creatures treat each other, especially those who are needy. There is no place in heaven for the principle of natural selection. It is contrary to the character of the God of peace. Natural selection is something that we have to live with here not something that was originally designed in. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that the justice so lacking in this world will one day be meted out by God himself. More so, the whole idea of a judgment implies a moral order. Why would judge God judge, much less punish, if there were no moral standards to which people could be held? <coughs> Think through the reality and certainty of judgment and why then is the gospel and the promise of salvation in Christ so crucial in order for us to have assurance in that judgment? Well, it is that if we live uh, in a way that uh, fits that judgment, then we can have some confidence. More importantly, if we, if we assent to that principle, it will be nice to have that principle vindicated. And then, this is, uh, we're now on Friday. Uh, according to scripture, Adam was the first man who was specifically created from the dust by God. Our understanding of the origin of morality is found in the origin of Adam. Biblical concepts of morality are then inseparable from biblical concepts of origin. Uh, recognizing Adam as the first human also refutes the possibility that any of fossils were in ancestral to Adam or the humans. And then the, he asked the question, what, how do you explain the fossils? And interestingly, he gives actually four different explanations. And there may be a combination of some of these that, that fit. First, they may be forms of humans with normal intelligence, but simply look different from us. Um, they may have been degenerate due to lifestyle, environmental stress, maybe genetics even. Um, maybe they're part of Satan's deliberate attempt to uh, degenerate humankind. Um, and finally, they, they may even have not been human, but uh, similar in morphology. In particular, I'm thinking of the Australopithecines. may have simply been a, a particular kind of ape that's no longer existent. Uh, different people may prefer different explanations, but because we do not have direct evidence to settle a matter, it is best to avoid being dogmatic in our speculations. Fossils do not come with labels attached that say made in China 500 million years ago or the like. Our understanding of Earth history, which varies greatly among scientists, provides a frame of reference 
with which we interpret the fossils, but we do not have proof of our interpretations. They are, in the end, only that, interpretations and nothing more. And I might add that uh, insofar as carbon-14 is concerned, they date relatively recently. The uh, creation of Adam was not a conversion of some other life form into a human. I'm now uh, going through very briefly some of the uh, thoughts that were in the book, or origins that are not clearly specified in the, uh, in the uh, quarterly itself. Um, it was a transformation of non-living material into a living being. So evolution of human from other animals is, is kind of ruled out by the uh, biblical account. God gave us responsibility, which is the basis of morality. Um, otherwise, what responsibility do you have to other people other than to not deliberately uh, give them trouble? And even that is a leftover Christian idea, not a pagan or atheist one. God gave us responsibility any system of, response, of morality based on reason or preference or happiness will be unstable. What was once moral may become immoral and vice versa, and what contributes to one person's happiness may detract from the happiness of another. And uh, that's the reason for having a, an outside judge to be able to tell you what's really right and wrong, rather than trying to make it up on your own. And then he talks about God using evolution, and he criticizes it in three different ways. In the first place, such a theory implies that God has an evil character. And he goes on to talk about that. God used evolution. It's an evil uh, process. Second, such theories imply that God wasn't able to create what he wanted directly, but was forced to do it in gradual steps. This makes him a weakling who can't be depended on to help to respond to prayer or to resurrect the dead. And I agree, if he can't, create, how is he going to recreate? Third, evolutionary creation implies that God holds us to a higher moral standard than he himself practices. That's almost the definition of hypocrite. And then uh, the, there are three discussion questions. I'll throw them out and you can discuss them as much as you want to, although we've kind of used up our time by now. Um, <clears throat> think through the implications of what it would mean if there was no creator who imposed a moral order on humanity. Where do you get morality from? Many people who don't believe in God nevertheless do hold some strict moral standards. How do they do that? On what basis other than God might a person be able to develop a moral code? What are some possible scenarios that they, they could come up with? What though would be the ultimate weakness in them all? And that, I think that, that the problem is that you don't have an objective reality you can appeal to if you reject uh, if, if you reject God as a creator and if you accept uh, a uh, creative process that involves uh, basically whatever it takes to make your progeny succeed. How does our view of creation inform our opinions regarding current issues such as euthanasia, cloning, abortion, etc.? And I think that, uh, you know, it does, this is somebody made in the image of God, you have to treat them with respect. Um, and three, a local citizen who volunteered his time to give tours at the Nazi concentra concentration camp of Dachau began the tour by talking about Tar Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, implying that Darwin's theory led to Dachau and the like. What's the obvious logic of that line of reasoning, and in what ways might it be flawed? And interestingly enough, there's another, and I t can't remember the camp, that was, uh, that they took a tour of in the movie Expelled, um, where the same kind of point came up. It's an easy connection to make. Um, if you mention it on the internet, you will find your ears blistered um, because, uh, or maybe it's your eyes, uh, because there are people who are very, very vigorously arguing that, that uh, Nazism did not come, uh, did not depend 
there was no connection whatsoever between Darwin and Nazism. Uh, my response to that is methinks they doth protest too much. But uh, uh, but it's an interesting uh, conflict you can get into. Um, a couple of comments. Go ahead. And that in itself raises another issue. Um, I believe, is it this... Ezekiel or Isaiah, I'm not sure which of those two, but in one of those passages where it speaks about Lucifer, it says, all the kings of the earth rest in their graves, but for you there will be no grave because you have destroyed your companions. So the promoters of evolution are quite literally destroying all links with those who have followed evolutionary thinking to its logical uh, conclusion, but whose outcome turns out to be less than favored by everybody. Yes, uh, one can argue about communism, whether it turned out to be good or bad, although I think the argument is going rather badly for the communists at this point. Um, but virtually everybody concedes that the Nazis right. blew it rather badly. But, you know, what and, and that's, that's why the yeah. That's why the defense is so vigorous, is because if they concede the point, they're putting Charles Darwin as the ancestor of the Nazis, and they don't want that at all. Well, the ancestor of Stalin, too. Uh, uh, and I, I see people trying to avoid the obvious when, you, when, you, when, the, when the argument gets that way. It's, and the arguments go, well, Stalin didn't like Darwin. He preferred uh, Lysenko. Uh, yes, but he got his early start with Darwin, and that's undisputable. It's uh, in, his, in his approved biographies. Uh, it just is. And... Uh, I don't think that everybody who believes in Darwin will turn out to be as bad as Stalin turned out to be. Um, but I do think that the tendency is to go that way. And uh, whenever you start saying that humankind doesn't have a God-given right, well then who's it given by? And if it's the government, can't the government take away that right if they have good enough reasons? And creating utopian society, isn't that a good enough reason? Mm -hmm. well, after all, we want our right to land, last for a thousand years, to be based on the most scientific ideas possible. Uh, we want the uh, dictatorship of the proletariat to gradually fade into a non-dictatorial reign where everybody's happy. And, uh, you know, if you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, why, why not? Uh, who's to say that those eggs don't need to be broken? Um, I see a lot of people that are living with kind of a split personality. They like the idea of Christianity favoring the weak. But they don't like the idea of Christianity telling you what you should be doing. And that there are some practices that, that really aren't helpful. And it's that kind of going along with half of it and not the other half that uh, 
confuses the picture and I think eventually will dissolve. It just may take some time before it becomes more clear. Yeah, a few things. Um, uh, first, I was going to say that uh, I was raised not in a religious household, so I, you know, basically my parents just taught us to be a good person. And, um, you know, there's some kind of uh, invisible code of, uh, of ethics or, uh, you know, uh, uh, morals, uh, although morals were not really mentioned, but, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, do, what, do the right thing. You know, there's a certain, certain type, type of, uh, you know, uh, just be a good person, do the right thing, be honest, you know, these kinds of values. And I, I think uh, further in the past, beyond my parents, were religious people, you know. So it was probably passed down from them, but it just wasn't, it's was kind of weeded out. Uh, and then another, uh, so that was the, the, the secular logic, I guess, of, uh, uh, but I think when you're talking about all these people that have a lot of power, and as they say, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, which I believe is true without a, a very strict code of conduct and ethics, like you just said, I think that that would be the logical thing. Well, everyone has their utopia, and actually uh, Hitler used the same models as his utopia. His ut was the Aryan race, and you know, and he took uh, steps uh, to create that, that reality. And uh, he saw everyone else as basically running contrary to it, so he took the natural course would be to, to crush the <laughs> whatever's in your way to accomplish your goal. Yeah. But he saw a utopia that ultimately was, uh, in, in his mind, it, it seems like a, a good thing, but uh, certain people would be enslaved, but, you know, there, he, would, he would have what he wants, and, and other people would, that were surrounding him would have that kind of utopia. Mm -hmm. Well, people, um, Hitler did some good things. Um, <coughs> many people forget that his, he was the inventor of the people's car, known in German as the Volkswagen. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so he wasn't, he wasn't all bad. That was, uh, that was cheap transportation for a lot of people in my day, and uh, the company's still there. I'll send and, uh, oh. you know, um, It's just that there were some blind spots in what he was doing, and those blind spots could have been corrected if he had had a strong doctrine of creation that said that he is made of one, ray, uh, one blood all nations of earth, and that uh, we didn't have the opportunity to be able to say that one race should be the master race. They definitely did some some amazing work. I mean, in, in not all good, but it's uh, with the yeah. rockets, with the uh, other things. But anyway, here's another angle too: is the uh, the Crusades. That's one you didn't mention that was very destructive for centuries, perhaps uh, if you go back far enough. And uh, the suffering and burning at the stake and all that was probably just as bad as any of the other guys you mentioned. And that was Maybe a misunderstanding worse. of, of uh, God's view of freedom. Exactly. That uh, uh, God valued freedom enough to create us free even though he knew that uh, it would turn out badly in the short run. In the long run, I think it will turn out okay. God will take care of that. But It'll be a long run so far. Ultimately, there, there seems to be a common uh, vein here that it's always domination. Domination creates, is, is on the negative side yeah. of this, or the ungodly yeah. side. Where it does, and, and you know, that's, that's one of the things that uh, we, we don't realize here in America how lucky we have it, 
that our first president decided not to be president for life. And, this and that because of his example, nobody until President Ro Roosevelt was president for life. And after President Roosevelt, they realized that that wasn't such a good idea and they made it uh, not just something that we had to follow George Washington's example, but that, uh, but that it was written into law that we had to, not, not just that it was a good idea. And um, I, think it has, I think it has done our country a great deal of good that people don't have the opportunity to hang on to power forever and ever. Um, you go to a lot of places and, and, uh, and uh, people are president for life, which means if you want to remove them, you have to shoot them. Uh, it's not, not good. Um, and the basic founding of our country was on sep separation of powers, basic to avoid that problem. I th I think is uh, that, that's the main exactly thing. right. That's exactly right. Um, uh, we uh, can guess from prophecy that the experiment won't end as well as we might wish it would. Uh, but it was a noble experiment, and I think one that uh, uh, one that I'm glad happened. Uh, and the church that we belong to, and other churches uh, as well, would not have the freedoms they had if it were not for uh, the government being deliberately set up to leave churches alone. We could we could thank all the tyranny for that, I guess, because without it, it probably wouldn't have been pushed through. Uh, but that gets back to, we were created to be free moral agents with our own judgment. And that's part of our morality, is to say that we need to be careful not to infringe on people's freedom, um, except as they infringe on other people's freedom, um, deliberately. And uh, I think that's that's an important part of morality as well. Uh, that particular part of morality probably would have saved us the cr Crusades, among other things. I guess the other thing is, the, like what's on the board now at Darwin's theory, it's survival of the fittest is maybe one of the primary uh, concepts that Darwin introduced that would be the major the major evil factor here or connection to why you say that's uh, kind of led to Dachau? I think I'll make one more point and then close. Um, and, th and that is this whole series of lessons has been partly on creation makes a big difference. And that this isn't some little side issue, that it goes to the foundation of our religion. And uh, that one of, the, one of the things it makes a difference in is how we approach morality. Uh, it's hard to do morality without a foundation. And other foundations that can be proposed don't don't really can't really fill the the bill can't really do the job. And I'm glad that we have this series of lessons because I think it's important for us to realize that, uh, and it's easy to forget it while we're fighting over the science involved. That there are huge, tremendous theological stakes that really are kind of non-negotiable. Um, and that there's a reason for us to argue about all that stuff and, you know, go into the technical details of, uh, of soft sediment deformation and uh, paleocurrents and uh, carbon-14 dating and radiometric dating in general. There's a really vitally important reason for going into all that detail is because it makes a difference. With that, I will invite you to come back next week, and uh, we'll uh, 
go over the fall.